So today is Bible Sabbath, the day when we celebrate the Bible, as you're well aware. And so I'd like to speak a little bit about one aspect of the Christian life today, one aspect of character that has led us to have a, have a Bible. And that character trait is endurance. And we saw that in that short video clip about the man Eton in Thailand, crippled from the waist down, sitting there on his bed, lying on his bed, translating away with all sorts of problems in his life. And yet he had one key element, endurance. And because he was a man who could endure, he was carrying on in the work that God had called him to. If he had no endurance, then he wouldn't be doing the work that God had selected for him. He wouldn't be making progress. But because of endurance, he was going ahead in the purposes of God for his life. And when you consider the Bible and all of the people, humanly speaking, who wrote the Bible, they all shared that one ingredient of endurance. And when you think of over the years, people around the world who have translated the Bible into other languages, many of them giving their lives in another country. They have all shared that one characteristic, endurance. And so we hold a Bible in our hands today, in our own language, because of that factor, endurance. Now, of course, there's other characteristics, other factors in play as well. But one of the unifying factors for all is the capacity to endure. Now let's have a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I want to consider this theme and look at one or two scriptures in regard to the, this factor endurance. Firstly, starting in 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17, a very familiar passage to us. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now that word complete is an interesting word in the, in the Greek language. Its core meaning is to be fresh. And from fresh, it means by implication to be complete. And you might think, well, what's the, what's the association between the word fresh and the word complete? I'd like to explain that with a, a little analogy about our, our property at home. Round the back of our shed, we have this enormous plum tree. And we planted this tree, and it's a wonderful tree. It's, it's amazingly um, robust. And at a certain time of year, these little green balls appear on the tree. It's quite amazing, really, when you think about it, isn't it? These little green balls just appear on the tree. Now, those little balls are hard and tough. And really, there's not much that you can do with them in that state. You can't play marbles with them. You can't play tennis with them. And you certainly can't eat them. But those little balls on the tree, they, they change and they develop over time. As the season changes, as other factors come into play, they grow, they change colour, and they become soft and attractive. And they get to the point where they are ripe, where they are fresh, where they are ready to eat. And at that point, I rush around the back of my shed and grab my plums. Now, when that, that plum is in that state of, of full ripeness, it's in the state, the full state that God has intended that little piece of fruit to be. And in that sense, that piece of fruit is complete. Now, we know that if we leave that fruit too long, it begins to, to decline from that state. But the freshness that God brings into our lives is eternal. And so we see that through the word of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and through our fellowship with one another, through the activity of God in our lives, we have the gift of God of freshness. 
And that freshness has within its scope the capacity to bring a sense of completeness and completeness and fullness to our lives. And so that's wonderful that God's word can minister to our lives freshness and have us on the road and pathway to maturity and completeness. Let's carry on to chapter 4 and verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So here we have the heavenly perspective, the heavenly point of view. Not just looking and considering the things of earth, the things that we see with our eyes, but having a heavenly perspective on life. And then in verse 2, we have the earthly function. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. And so in verse 1, we have the heavenly perspective that gives us in verse 2 the, the <coughs> earthly function. And if you take away the heavenly perspective, you lose the earthly function. Both have to go together. Moving on to verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. So verse 3, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Isn't it interesting that the Bible tells us that sound doctrine is something that we have to endure? To grow as a Christian, we have to endure sound doctrine. Now, I don't think that means endure in the sense that you've got this big burden on your back and you have to struggle and strain and it's hard and it's difficult and it's, it's wearisome. I don't think that's what it means. I think it's talking in the sense of having the capacity to start something and continue in the same direction. We need to have the capacity to endure sound doctrine. And so we, we keep to the task, we keep learning, we keep growing, we keep focused on, on what it is all about, knowing and serving the Lord Jesus. We endure, we do not give up, we do not go back, we do not go down, but we go upwards in the purposes of God. So the Bible tells us we have to endure, we have to continue in sound doctrine. And this thought is also mentioned in the book of Hebrews, if we look at Hebrews chapter 5. And this speaks about coming to maturity as Christians, and as you know it talks about the analogy of being a baby and coming into being a, a child and growing into manhood and comparing that to the Christian walk. So let's have a look at that in Hebrews chapter 5 and starting at verse 11. And this is speaking about the deeper things of the Lord Jesus Christ. So at verse 11 it says, Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For by this time you ought to be teachers. For though, this, so, sorry, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and and evil. So it tells us in verse 12 that by this time you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you again the first principles. Now, therein lies a very, very important lesson for us. We see in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and chapter 4 that it's talking to us about going on in God in the Christian life about walking the pathway of completeness, with God continuing to touch our lives, continuing to change our lives as time passes. It speaks about the need to endure sound doctrine, to stick to the task. And what's sp spoken about here is the result of not being able to endure sound doctrine. 
Notice it says you have need again to be taught the first principles of the oracles of God. So what's going on, in, on, on, on here is instead of moving ahead and forwards in the teachings of Jesus Christ, the life begins to go circular. You have need again to be taught those first things. And you see, in, in the modern age of Christianity, in, in some settings in, in our modern time, that the teaching is circular. In other words, it's the same things again and again, just going in circles, maybe speaking about this aspect of it, that aspect of it, and presenting a message in terms of perhaps um, slogans rather than going into the depths of the word of God. And so what you have as a result of that is you have Christians who do not grow, but they go circular. It's always the same teaching. It's always the same subject matter. And it doesn't move on. Because to endure sound doctrine, we have to dig. See, the truths of God's word are like treasures in, in a field. Imagine if you went out into, the, into your backyard this afternoon when you got home and you discovered there was treasure in your backyard. Diamonds and rubies and precious jewels were all buried there by some pirate in your backyard. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I would go home today and I would think that was pretty good. But in order to get those jewels and those precious things, I would have to dig. Standing there and watching my backyard wouldn't produce for me the jewels. And it's the same with the word of God. And the deeper that you go into the scriptures, the more jewels you find. And if you want to learn about the teaching of repentance, repentance, you could say, is like a ruby. But all the rubies are not in one place. The Bible's not like a book of theology, and you look up repentance, and it's all there in one little paragraph. You, you find a ruby in this part of the Bible. You find a ruby in that part, and another one over there. And as you, as you read the, the breadth of the scriptures, you find that, that as you dig deeper and deeper, you see these truths, and you begin to understand and learn how they all come together and give you a, a full, rounded understanding of what the Bible says about a topic. But you don't get to that if you don't endure in the scriptures. One of the problems of today is false expectations. And it's like some of these television advertisements that advertise a particular toothpaste. And they say, look, if you start using this particular toothpaste, all your life will change. Suddenly, you'll have a girlfriend. Suddenly, you'll have a good job. Suddenly, your appearance will change and your hair will look a lot better and, and your life will be successful because you're using this particular toothpaste. But the only problem with that is it's not true. You see, there's a capacity in our lives to endure that we all need in order to, to achieve not only what God wants for our lives, but just to, just to make progress as people. The capacity to endure. It's not a matter, you've just got the right toothpaste. I'm using the right soap now. I'm using the right deodorant. Now everything in my life is going to come right. And sometimes that attitude tr transfers over into the Christian life. And we present the, the truths of the Bible as if there's a quick fix. And sometimes God does touch our lives with a quick fix and brings an instant change to a situation. And that's absolutely wonderful when that happens. And we need more of that. But there's also many, many, many times when it's just a matter of enduring. And when we read our Bibles, sometimes something will leap out at us and we'll have a wonderful revelation. And that's great. But there are many times when we read the Bible simply because we know it's helping us and God is working in our lives if we read it. And as we do, that process at, at work of the treasures in the field is, is happening, whether we realize it or not. And because of that capacity to endure and to spend time with God, we find that over time, God does his work. But I think many Christians today are cheated 
out of much of what God has for them because they think it's going to be a quick fix. Many, many things come to us on the pathway of endurance that we get no other way. Let's turn in our Bibles now to the, the book of Revelation in chapter 21. And this speaks about the, the destination, really, where we, we are all heading as, as Christians. And it's a wonderful, wonderful passage. And the changes that God is bringing into our lives today, the freshness that he desires for us to, to walk in, the, the, the ultimate destination of all of that change is found in these verses, Revelation 21, verses 1 to 5. And this is what it says. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. You wonder what on earth the people of Northland are going to do with their time. And that day, there'll be no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them, and will be their God. So that's speaking about open-hearted, open-faced relationship with God. And that is where we are all heading as, as, as Christians. Isn't that amazing? And the changes that are occurring in our lives today are preparing us for then. It goes on in verse 4, firstly speaking about the past. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So all of the past that, that's had the sorrow and, and, the, and the stress and, and the worry and the despair, every sense of that is eradicated from, from us. And then it speaks about the present state then. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, and there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And then it says this interesting thing in verse 5. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. When it says, he makes all things new. In the Greek language, that word new means new in the sense of freshness. Isn't that interesting? New in the sense of freshness. So in other words, God will make everything fresh, you see. So the freshness that God touches our lives with today through his word is a taste of the freshness to come. And when you think about the little plum on the tree that goes from a hard, green, round ball into a luscious and beautiful piece of fruit, full of, full of life-giving nutrition, beautiful to the taste, beautiful to the touch, God is going to change everything like that. And we will be fitted for that environment forever. Isn't that amazing? But in the meantime, down here on good old planet Earth, we have need of the capacity to endure. Now I'd like to mention a story about a particular gentleman which you may or may not have heard of. This man's name is Bishop Samuel Isaac Joseph Shevineski. Quite a memorable name, which you wouldn't want to repeat fast in a conversation too many times. Shevineski. Now this is going way, way back into... Um, 1831 when this man was born. So I'll just read what it says about him here. So this man Samuel Shevineski was born a Jew in Lithuania in 1831 and when he reached youth he decided to become a rabbi. So grew up as, as a Jewish boy and wanted to do the ultimate thing really become a rabbi. And he went away to train but what happened was that at that time, the London Society for Promoting Christianity Among Jews, which I've never heard of, 
sent him a copy of the New Testament in Hebrew. And through reading that New Testament in the Hebrew, he became a Christian. So this young man who was training to be a rabbi was given a New Testament, and through reading that New Testament, he became a Christian. It goes on to say he dropped out of rabbinical school, walked 500 miles to Germany, and sometime later sailed to America where he eventually studied theology. And he eventually became an Anglican priest and was sent to work in Shanghai in China. So obviously in those days he was fit and strong, not like the man we saw in the video, paralysed from the waist down, but he was able to walk 500 miles. Trained for the ministry, off to China as a missionary. So Samuel had a genuine gift for languages. Before his death in 1906, he had done an extraordinary amount of translation. Working by himself, he translated the Old Testament into Chinese Mandarin and the Gospels into Mongolian. He helped translate the New Testament into Mandarin and prepared a dictionary of the Mongolian language. In addition to that, he translated the Book of Common Prayer into Mandarin and translated the Bible into a language called Wenli. And he was considered one of the world's top experts on the Orient. So here was a man who had the capacity to endure, not only to walk 500 miles with his physical body, but to, but to study and to learn and to apply himself to give the Bible to other people. And he eventually became the Bishop of Shanghai in 1877. But he only had that position from a few years because he became very ill because of overwork, sunstroke, and Parkinson's disease. He was left paralysed. When Western doctors could not help, he asked to return to China. This request was refused. He then acquired a typewriter and spent the rest of his life doing what he did best, translation. Now, some of you young people here today may not know what this strange thing is that's called a typewriter. Now, most of us who are a little senior in years know how a typewriter works. You have the, have the keys, and you press a key, and then a little arm comes up and goes bang onto the page. And on the end of that little arm is the impression of a letter. And there's ink on that letter, and so what happens is that when that presses onto the page, boom, it leaves the imprint of, of, of that particular letter. And as you keep pressing these keys in the right sequence, the arms keep going up and down, and eventually you create language. It's amazing, a typewriter. So it's, it's a bit like something that Noah used on the ark, isn't it? A typewriter. And it's quite a laborious process using a typewriter. Anyway, he acquired a typewriter and did translation. Most of the time he was in a wheelchair. Now listen to this. He says, I have sat in this chair for over 20 years. It seemed very hard at first, but God knew best. He kept me for the work for which I am best fitted. So what does that speak of? endurance you see endurance and also it goes on he typed the last 2,000 pages of one bible translation using a single finger 2,000 pages not 2,000 words 2,000 pages he typed with only one finger why because the rest of his fingers had stopped working. That is man who had the capacity to endure, you see. He started out as a young man, he walked 500 miles, but at the end of his life, all of that energy and strength that had been used for God's glory all came down to one finger, and he used that finger for the glory of God. That is the capacity to endure. And as we carry on in life, you know, there's many obstacles that, that come in our path. And as we grow, grow older, there's many obstacles that, that arise for us. But with God's help, we can endure and, and get to the end of it, our journey. And like Paul says, ending our journey in, in the way that God is honoured, in the way that, that God is blessed and, and pleased with, with the walk that we've We've 
carried out over the years and the destination we've come to. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean we, we have to walk a path where we never make a mistake because we, we carry ourselves along the journey. But in Jesus there is forgiveness and in Jesus there is always hope and in Jesus is the power to help us and strengthen us to endure. So as we read our Bibles and we consider this, this wonderful book that we have on Bible Sabbath, remember the endurance that, that the people who have given us this book all shared and the, the endurance we need today to carry on with God and to get to the wonderful destination he has for us all. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it, it is a gift to us. And Lord, it's so easy for us to obtain a Bible. So easy for us, Lord, to open the pages. But Lord, we also acknowledge before you the great cost of placing this Bible into our hands. Not only in, in um, terms of, of money and finance and all the money that's been poured into producing Bible translations over the years and translating the Bible into so many languages around the globe and all of that kind of thing. But also the, the heart issues, Lord, of the people who have sacrificed so much of their lives to give us the word of God and to see the word of God go all around the globe in a multitude of languages. And Lord, we honour your word today. We honour you. We honour your faithfulness to so many of your servants who have served you faithfully, in many cases anonymously, for the glory of a heavenly reward. And help us, Lord, in our lives today as we live you day after day and face the struggles and the trials of daily life. That, Lord, you would bless us and give us, Lord, the capacity to be single-focused and the capacity to endure and to grow in you, not only in doctrine and in truth, but in our relationship with you and our experience of, of your life. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to remain fresh in you down through the years also as you continue to touch our lives through your word. May it not become boring and old. May it be ever fresh, a tool in your hands to shape us and to guide us till our journey's end. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're now going to sing together hymn number 499. What a friend we have in Jesus. Thank you. <laughs>